Hello, my name is Sula, and this is my multi-part series, Sula's Complete Video Guide to Becoming an Amateur Astronomer, and this is Chapter 4, Placement of the Stars, the Planets, the Moon, and the Sun. In Chapter 2, I went over some basic astronomy, and I mentioned that over time, the North Star has changed over thousands of years, and that may have created some confusion because I got a question from a viewer about the placement of the stars. So I thought I would go into that a little bit more in this chapter. But first, did you do your homework? Did you go outside and look with the naked eye and try to learn the constellations by using the pointer stars and the Big Dipper and learning some of the major constellations like Leo? And did you notice how the constellations moved across the sky from east to west? I hope so. Now I hope you'll continue to go out and look with some binoculars and look at some binocular view objects like the Beehive Cluster or the Coma Cluster. Anyway, today I do have some balls <laughs> to help me with explaining the placement of the stars. These are not at all to scale, but they're just to help us to get an idea about what's going on in the sky. So first of all, the North Star has changed over thousands of years, but that's not because the stars are moving. They do move an eensy, weensy, weensy bit, but nothing compared to how we on Earth are hurtling through space. And by that, what I mean is these balls represent the planets, and this one is Earth, and this is our moon. So as I mentioned, the Earth spins on its own axis. So imagine that this hiking pole goes right through the center of this ball, the Earth, and that's our axis. And we rotate counterclockwise. It takes 24 hours for the Earth to make one rotation. Now, while it's rotating, the Earth, which is tilted 23 degrees, wobbles a little bit where this axis comes out. And because of that wobbling, that is what makes it appear that the North Star has changed over time. So this is our sun, which this ball is not at all representative of its size. It's enormous and it would take hundreds and hundreds of Earths to go across the face of the sun. This is Mercury, this is Venus, this is the Earth and our Moon, this is Saturn, I'm sorry, this is Mars, the orange planet, this is Jupiter, this is Saturn, this is Uranus, and this is Neptune. All of these planets are revolving around the Sun in an elliptical motion at different speeds. The Earth takes one year, approximately, to rotate around our Sun. But while we're rotating around the Sun, we're also spinning on our own axis. So if I'm on this ball, I'm spinning like this, while I'm also spinning like this. It made me dizzy. This star in this tree is Vega. It shouldn't be moving. Pretend that it's not moving. The wind is blowing it. And this ball is the Earth. So I'm standing on Earth and I go out at night and I look at Vega and the Earth is spinning counterclockwise. So my body is going like this and Vega appears to set, but it hasn't gone anywhere. It's right there. And when the Earth makes a 24-hour rotation, I get up again in the evening, and there's Vega, same place. Now, over a month, it will appear to have moved because while I'm spinning in a counterclockwise motion, the Earth is going around the Sun. So that's why the constellations change with the seasons. So that's why the stars appear to move, but they're not moving. We're moving. We're rotating on the Earth's axis, and we're rotating around the Sun. Now let's talk about the other planets 
and the Sun and the Moon. Venus, which is the second closest planet to the Sun, takes 225 days to revolve around the Sun and it curiously rotates clockwise while we rotate counterclockwise. And Venus and Mercury always appear in the sky either in the early dawn hours or the early evening hours because they're so close to the Sun. Very, very rarely Venus will get between the Sun and the Earth. And if you look at it from the Earth, you can see Venus move across the Sun and that's called a transit. And there was one in 2016, I think, but there isn't going to be another transit of Venus across the Sun, I think, till 2035. So if you missed the one in 2016, you're probably out of luck, unless you're extremely young. I'm out of luck. <laughs> Venus has a very thick atmosphere that is sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen. And so even though it's not that far away from us relative to the other planets, no matter how big your telescope, any Earth-based telescope will not reveal any of the features of the surface of Venus. It'll always just look like a dusty cloud ball. But it does show phases to us on Earth as it moves around the sun and at times it looks like a crescent just like our moon does. This is the earth and this is our moon. While the earth is rotating around the sun the moon is rotating around the earth. It takes 23.7 days for the moon to make one rotation around the earth. So when the moon gets in this position between the earth and the sun that's when it's called a new moon we're only seeing the dark side of the moon. So when people say it's a new moon, there's no moon. Or there is a moon, you just can't see it. And when it moves between the Earth and the Sun, then it's a full moon. So you might be asking yourself, well if the moon moves between the Earth and the Sun, why don't we get a total solar eclipse every month when it does that? Well the answer is that the moon's orbit is tilted five degrees off of the orbit of the Earth and therefore it doesn't precisely line up except twice a year somewhere on Earth. The moon gets precisely between the Earth and the Sun and that creates a total solar eclipse. And when it lines up precisely between the Earth and the Sun, we get a total lunar eclipse. And when the Moon moves 90 degrees from the Sun, that's when we see a quarter Moon, although it looks like half. And if it's moving towards the position between the Earth and the Sun, that means it's waning and when it's on this side and it's getting bigger, it's waxing gibbous, moving this way between the Earth and the Sun to become a full moon. And the reason that your star chart doesn't tell you the position of the planets is that they are constantly revolving around the Sun against the backdrop of the stars. Jupiter, for example, takes 24 years to make one rotation around the Sun. The path that all of the planets make around the Sun is called the ecliptic and all of the planets can be found within a few degrees of the ecliptic as they travel around the Sun. Imagine that this ball is the Earth and the Earth has an equator that separates the northern hemisphere from the southern hemisphere and if you imagine the equator as an imaginary line on the sky, that is the celestial equator. But it does not exactly coincide with the ecliptic because the Earth is tilted 23.5 degrees on its axis. So the ecliptic is a little above and a little below the celestial equator. 
if you have a clear view of the horizon, you see the sun rise in the east and then set in the west. But as the seasons go by, it appears to set at different locations, moving westward as the seasons go by. And the reason is that the sun also is tilted on the ecliptic. As the sun moves through the ecliptic through the year, it reaches 23.5 degrees north of the celestial equator on June the 21st and it reaches 23.5 degrees south of the celestial equator on December the 21st in Sagittarius and those two days are called the solstices. June the 21st is the summer solstice and December the 21st the winter solstice. Here in the northern hemisphere we call it that. At the summer solstice the sun appears to rise and set far to the north and on the winter solstice the sun appears to rise and set far to the south. And on the equinoxes it appears to rise and set far to the east or west depending on which equinox. Right now the moon is waxing gibbous. That means it's getting bigger and bigger as it orbits around us and it'll soon be full and right now is a good time to go outside and look at it in the twilight so it doesn't blind you and you can see the Sea of Tranquility where the Apollo 11 landed. No you can't see Neil Armstrong's footprints. No, you can't see the flag, but you can see the Sea of Tranquility. And you can see some craters that are astounding right now, so this is a good time to study the moon. Mercury, the planet closest to the sun, will be its brightest and easiest to spot in the early evening sky from April 18th to May 10th, 2022. Venus will continue to be a morning star all the way through August 27, 2022. There is going to be a meteor shower on April the 21st, going into the early morning hours of April the 22nd, the Lyrid meteor shower. Mars is currently in the morning sky and is at magnitude 2 and passing through Ophiuchus, but as the year goes by, Mars will get closer and closer to the Earth, culminating at opposition on December the 8th, when it will be at a magnitude negative 1.9, and only 50 million miles from Earth. Mars is very difficult to see always. It's very much dependent on atmospheric conditions and seeing, but when it's at opposition, it's an excellent time to try to see Mars later this year. On April the 30th, 2022, there will be a conjunction between Venus and Jupiter when they will be half a degree apart in the early morning hours. So be sure to catch that and check out other celestial events in your copy of Sky and Telescope or wherever you get your celestial news. That's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this episode, Chapter 4 of Sula's Complete Video Guide to Becoming an Amateur Astronomer. I'll see you in the next chapter. Until then, I hope you have access to dark skies and that you're getting out there and enjoying them. So long till next time, Sula, signing off.